Good evening, everyone. This is Dolores Cannon with the Metaphysical Hour. We're live. This is June 27th, the year 2014. And we have really had a busy week. We just got through with our ninth transformation conference, and it was a huge success. Yes, it was. So we're going to be talking about that and things relating to that. So if anyone wants to call in tonight, uh, we would welcome any of your calls. The toll-free number is 888-627-6008. We're still recuperating because we had the conference, and then we had a class right after it. We had a reunion before the conference. Yeah. A practitioner reunion. One day that on that. Mm-hmm. So that was eight really... Eight days of function. That was our second one. Mm-hmm. It was really nice. Mm-hmm. That's where we have some of our practitioners, our students, come and they all get together and, and they had some, really some interesting things that went on that day. And then we went right into the conference, which was uh, three days. Right. Then afterwards, the class, level two class, and they came from all over the world for the level two. Uh, one thing we thought was interesting with the level two, that 90% of them this time were students that had taken the class online. And I think that's the most we've ever had in yeah. you know, class. Yeah, usually it's about half. This one was 90%, but it could be because um, our teaching <laughs> live level ones right now. So. Yeah, you know, I said before, I think, or I think I said it on the air, that we weren't going to be doing that many live level ones because uh, we're trying to cut out on the long, the long trips overseas, those really long 14, 16-hour flights. So we are doing that many live ones this year. And that may be why, because... They, you know, the ones we work with, said, let technology take over, and it can do it. And it is. Yeah, because I was really surprised that we had that many. We knew we've had a lot of online students, but because we can't see them, it it makes it hard to really appreciate that. But um, this one was about 90% of this class were the ones that had taken it online. And they came from all over the world. We had several from China, Japan, um, Australia, Mexico. Where else? There was. <laughs> uh, well, one was from the class in Italy, but I'm not sure where she was actually from. The, another one was from Norway, but right. she had taken the class in Finland. Right. But I want to make it clear now we're only going to have one live level one class this whole year, anywhere in the world, and that's going to be in September, right here in Arkansas. So if anybody wants to take that, that's your only chance this year to do a live one. Otherwise, it'll have to be online. Right. And people are signing up for that already. There's going to be a level two with that one also. But, you know, you can't take the level two unless you have done 10 sessions, 10 different people after you have level one. So this will be the only one anywhere in the world. So if anybody's interested, this is your chance to call in the office and uh, sign up for that. Next month in July, we're going to be in England and we'll be doing a a level two there. That's that's all, no um, level one. Right. In Glastonbury, mm-hmm. the magical place right. where we have our office. Well, and that one's going to be interesting because they have um, the, the goddess festivals and the different festivals going on at the same time. And it's like we're right between these two different festivals. Oh. Uh-huh. And then we'll also be doing a tour um, after the class to Stonehenge and I'm not sure if Avery's in it. It might be. Uh, then also the White Horse of Uffington. So we're going to have some fun doing that. Uh-huh. So people are signing up for that, too, in connection with it. We've got got a lot of things going on. We're boring here. (laughs) But 
but I'm just not going to be doing so many out of the country trips. In August, Julia is going to be going back to Asia. Because, you know, we just got home in time for Christmas this last year, and we had two weeks in Beijing, a week in uh, Tokyo, a week in Taiwan, and a week in Sydney, Australia, giving classes, six classes in six weeks. So um, those are the ones they said we had over 100 people in the one in Beijing, and they said when we left, don't desert us. Mm -hmm. Don't forget about us. We want to have the um, level two training. So Julia's going back over there by herself to do it. So this will be a new one. This will be a new one. Oh. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. We got distractions here. This will be a new one. Yes. Yeah, so the thing is, is I think people want. They think they're getting gypped, I think, because it's me and not you. They want you. That's like when we were talking to the one putting the class on in China. You know, I know they want you. They realize this has to happen. Um, but one of the things we'll be doing is we just recorded this class we just did. Yeah. And so a large part of the class we do in these other places will be that recording. So they will still be getting you teaching them. Yeah, and then you'll be coming in by Skype at one point and answering questions, so they'll get you live. I'll, the only part that's not you is where we do one little section, and that's where I'll be doing that with them. So they really are still getting you <laughs> because of technology. Yeah, that's it. They said let technology take over, right. and so that's what's happening now. <laughs> so... Um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Mm -hmm. Right. But if it is recording, it'll be almost the same thing. Yes. And that's the first time I'm going to come in by Skype, so I don't know what that's, how that's going to work. The difference in the time zone. Right. We're going to got to coordinate that. <coughs> <coughs> to make sure. That might be the middle of the night here. It might be. <laughs> <laughs> get up in the middle of the night and do it, I won't even know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> that could be fun. <laughs> well, we're always trying new things, so this will be something new to try. Right. But we don't want to abandon the ones over there. Right. And they're having such excellent results. That's what I thought was very interesting, is that the ones who took the level one that we just did, level two, they're having results. It, it's working, yeah. even though I'm not right there in front of them live. Yes, yes. listeners, she has an, an issue when she can't see things. She doesn't think it's happening. And so we keep trying to, to like, make sure she knows um, that it's actually happening out there. We actually So that was really encouraging when 90% of the class took it online. So that showed her, yes, it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> because we're used to getting up and having all those bodies right there. Okay, but anyway, that was an interesting class. Uh, but I guess we should, we want to talk about the conference we just had, and it was a really tremendous success. Our ninth one. We started it nine years ago as a showcase for our authors because we thought a lot of the authors didn't had never done any lecturing. And books don't sell themselves just sitting on the shelf. You have to get out and promote, and a lot of them didn't know how to do it. Yeah, the author is the spokesperson for their book. Yeah, the, they the have voice. to push it. Mm -hmm. The voice of the book. But some of them were afraid or they mm -hmm. never done it, so we thought, well, we do it in a more or less friendly atmosphere, let them get their feet wet, mm -hmm. but like we said, it's kind of like throwing them in the deep end. Well, of the they've pool. got a large audience now. That first year, I think we had just under a hundred, and that was a nice little group. But then now we're we we two fifty to three hundred is not uncommon at all, and uh, and it's growing. So I think a couple of years ago we had four hundred, but there's still a few of the authors that are nervous, but that's natural. Uh, these, all these speakers were fantastic. They were. Even I had though, even so many somebody. compliments on how wonderful everybody was. 
even though some of them were a little scared. But, but. Well, I mean, that's pretty normal. I mean, you're going to be nervous speaking in public. <laughs> uh-huh. But they have such fantastic stories to tell. That's why I chose to publish their book. So they need to tell that, and people did like it. I, we didn't hear any complaints at no, all. No, I didn't hear any. <laughs> okay, we're going to just talk a little bit about the ones who gave their talks and what they were talking about. But we had the most wonderful music every day. We had Armand and uh, Angelina. Armand. Armand, Armand, Armand and Angelina. They're a couple, and I've heard them sing at other conferences, and they were so fantastic, I wanted to get them here. Right. But they're in a big demand, so it took a while to get them here. Oh, they're beautiful voices, and the music was absolutely perfect. Mm -hmm. And we had that every morning. Right. And now we've secured them for next year. (laughs) Yeah, we said, we want to get you ahead of time before you have a chance to uh, book something else on those dates. Right. Maybe we should tell them we are changing the date. Next well, year. it changes every year. <laughs> it's not in June, and it's going to be in uh, July. July 17th to the 19th. Mm-hmm. So our main keynote speaker, because in addition to having all our authors, we always have the new ones coming up every year. Anybody with new books. New books, mm-hmm. yeah. Right. Uh, we have about, what we said, five to ten new books we publish every year. Maybe more than that? Yes, more than that. She's frowning at me because that's like, their department. More like 10. Every year as an average. Right. And we got a bunch more lined up that will be coming out next year, too. So we, uh, in addition to having the new books from the authors and the new authors coming in, we always have a keynote speaker. And this year we brought Robert Baval from Spain, and he did two talks on two different days, so he really spoke for four hours all together. Right. And he's kind of can really talk. He, he's got a lot of information, and he just keeps going on and on. Yeah, it's a wealth of information. And he's an expert on um, the, uh, the pyramids and the Sphinx. Yeah, Egypt. Egypt is his back door. Uh-huh. <laughs> I think he said he, he lived over there for quite a while. Right. Well, he's Egyptian. Now he's living in Spain. Right. But he had some really good information. And he was one of the lectures he gave had to do with the Vatican well, and was... the connection with the Vatican. Mm-hmm. And I know when I was there... When it was at the Vatican, I mostly wanted to see the Sistine Chapel. But uh, we had a really good guide when I was there, and he was telling us a lot of things that most people don't know because the Pope doesn't want them, everybody to know all these things. But there is a real connection with Egypt right there at the Vatican. In the, the square, when you go in, where the buildings are, there is an Egyptian museum. And it has an obelisk, obelisk outside the uh, museum and all kinds of Egyptian uh, artifacts on the outside. So there's definitely a connection. Because we know a lot of the things from the Bible really goes back to ancient Egypt and their legend. So I was aware of that. But he brought some of that out. Mm-hmm. That he was talking about the... Um, Mostly about the alignment with the the shafts and the sphinx with the constellation Orion. That was on the Egypt talk. Yeah, he had two right. two different ones. Right. <laughs> I mix them up. Yeah, you're mixing <laughs> them up here <laughs> because he he lectured on two different mm-hmm. days, but mostly talking about the alignment with Orion. And he's going to go back and do some more work in the sphinx too. You know, and that, I'm, when I was looking at that, it was like, you know, because when I was in them, it, it, you know you're in a machine. But then he was making, he's aligning them with these, with these equinoxes is what he was 
showing. They line with, and which we've seen several things align with equinoxes. Oh yeah, it's like that's what yeah. they did in the ancient world. Right. So that's interesting. So it's like, okay, well, if it aligns with the equinox, then then what? That's my question. I don't know if he ever said, well, what's the purpose of lining up with the equinox? Well, in my new book, we're covering all this, you know, the lot of lost, lost knowledge. And the ancient people were really taught by the ETs, mm -hmm. and it had to do with the equinoxes, with the planting and the harvesting and the growing okay. of crops. So you'd be in... But see, those shafts aren't really made for people to go in and out. We've, they've got things in them now so you can go down them. But when I went in there, I was like, man, they have to be small people. And they said, no, people didn't go into here. So even though they call it a queen's chamber and a king's chamber and all these things, it's not, people weren't in there. So wonder what, okay, if it lined up with the equinox, then what did it do? Because it wasn't for a person to go, okay, we're lined up now, you can plant. <laughs> I'm just, well, you Stonehenge know. and New Grain, right, they're lined up. Right, and you can sit in those, but the pyramids are not designed to actually be in. And let's say, well, they said they found doors. Now, if those doors open, then you can go in there and maybe do that. Otherwise, you're not going to walk down the shaft like they have us doing now. But I still believe there's a whole lot of the pyramids that have not been explored. Because they said nobody even gotten in there till that man years and years and years ago broke a hole in the side. I think that was in the 20s. Somewhere yeah. back then, and they got into the pyramid. But that's why they were able to find the shaft that goes up there. But who knows what else is in there? That's true, yeah. And you think they could x-ray it. Man. That's why they draw those pictures. I think they, they have. I think yeah. they tried x-raying it and using radar, but it went crazy. Okay. It's mostly because of the energy that's in there. So there is a tremendous amount of energy in that pyramid. Imagine what it was like when it was all together, you know, before right. it was messed with. Right. Well, and that's where the people that I went on the tour with, they, they said they felt the pyramids were activators. Or, you know, yeah, yeah, activators. Or amplifiers, amplifiers. Amplifiers yes. for the Earth. Or whatever. <laughs> They're all sitting next to that temples next to each one of them. Every one of them is designed that way. And so I don't know if it amplifies something you're doing in the temple. I don't know. Amplifies something that's in there. It lines up with the equinox. I don't know. That's just it. What are you doing? You hear a lot of the <laughs> mysteries that surround them. Like, yeah, Julia was there, and she said she felt she was inside of a machine. Yeah. Very definitely. Which was a very strange feeling. I know. It's, it's strange that you would think that you could feel that. But then I talked to other people, and I said, oh, most definitely. Um, but that's how it felt. It, I couldn't even describe it to you. It just felt like you're inside of a machine. But they've never found any tombs. that if no. Nobody's buried there. No. Has and like he was saying, you know, where the tombs are, where people, they do things like that, they do hieroglyphs. They, they do things to honor the dead. There's, there are no hieroglyphs in the pyramid. You're not. Mm -hmm. so, There's hieroglyphs in the temple. Yeah. And that would make sense that they might do things there, but not in the pyramid. So. But Robert Bilbao has been on Ancient Aliens. I saw him on there several times, so he's considered an expert in that part of the world. But, you know, most of those people on Ancient Aliens have a lot of experience in exploring the hidden mysteries in the wow. parts of the world. And he goes back to these places yeah. every once in a while to look for something else. Yeah, he had some <coughs> groundbreaking news, I mean, some things, discoveries that they're, they're coming up with, and then we may be able to present them next year, um, some things that are happening over there. Apparently a lot is happening in Egypt, you yeah. know, to, about the pyramids. I think they said, you know, Hadi Sawas has always been one who has suppressed mm -hmm. a lot of the information and knowledge over all these years and kept anybody from finding anything out. But they said now he's not, his, his influence is not as powerful as it used to be. So they're, they're able to find more things. Because I saw a program last night that some woman was doing it uh, from, from satellites. 
than they were able to see underground with the satellite images that we can't see from, from the surface. Right. And they could see pyramids that are have not been discovered that are underground. In Egypt or anywhere? Egypt. Okay. That's where they're mostly focusing on. Yeah. And they wanted to, wanted to dig, but of course you have to have permission to dig. Right. Well, that's like when the people are with, it's like if we could just get rid of all the sand, we could <laughs> see what's under because it's just so... It's, a lot of sand over the years has just covered everything up. <laughs> you just get rid of that sand, there's probably all kinds of things there, <laughs> cities and cities. And <laughs> I remember when I was a kid, the only pictures they had of the space were just from the shoulders up. Oh, okay. That's all there was, just the head sticking out of the mm-hmm. sand. And then over the years then, they excavated more and more, right. and they found the whole body and the uh, paws. Right. So... Well, and when I was there, there was excavation going on everywhere. So it's constant. They're constantly digging. Uh huh. But it's interesting. They said this woman was taking all these satellite images mm-hmm. and comparing them. That there definitely is stuff underground. It probably is more than we could imagine for the whole area. <laughs> but I like the ancient aliens. And there's another one. Well, America on Earth is where they find a lot of stuff in America. Right. We're going to try to get him from one of our conferences, too. But I think there's another show, too, about the mysteries over there. But I love a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, he was very interesting talk. And I think we probably will have him back. We'll be seeing him again anyway. Right. We're going to be talking about that in a little bit. Right. <clears throat> but some of the other speakers we had... Well, we had some of our authors. We had Sherry O'Brien is one of our new authors, and she was she's a psychologist and a psychotherapist, and she was mostly talking about how to recover from, from loss and about grieving. Right. I think I've had her on the show. Yeah, it was just a few weeks ago, a couple <laughs> weeks ago, and, and the biggest thing there was... Um, establishing that, you know, there are so many kinds of loss. And it can be, you know, loss of uh, the lifestyle, loss of your dream, or loss of um, job, job, things like that, in addition to loss of a uh, significant other, yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, because so, it's not only grieving from the loss of a or death of someone, but it's also other things, like, you know, a broken marriage, you're losing a job. There's a lot of things that we right. grieve over. So it was very good the way she talked about it. Her her new book is Peaks and Valleys, talking about how to handle the grief. I think there were exercises in there, too. Yeah, integrative approaches to uh, recovering from loss. That's the tag. That's the subtitle. And she has a lot of meditations and a lot of different things to do. Uh-huh. We have a lot of new authors, but Blair Styro was there. He's our old, old friend from New Zealand, and he's the most famous uh, psychic or channeler in channel. New Zealand. Yeah, he, yeah, the channel. <laughs> Although we know he's psychic, but he's a channel. <laughs> he considers himself a channel. Yeah. And the one he channels is called Tabash, and he's been doing this for many years. Because the first time I went to New Zealand, we did lectures together. And, like, he wanted to introduce me to New Zealand. And then we brought him over here. What was that, 2010? 10, yeah. <clears throat> and we were introducing him to America. And we were going all over the United States doing talks. And so he could... People loved him everywhere oh. he went. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I love how... I mean, as when Blair channels Tabash, Tabash completely takes over Blair's body. Yeah. And so, let's see, I'm not sure what the name of that is. It's a, what do they call well, that? conscious channel, but that's nothing else. No, that's something else. So this would be, but the thing is, is most of the people that do that, they are lying in a bed or they're sitting in a chair, with their eyes closed. <clears throat> Blair, he wanted it to be where he was, he, he didn't want to be like that. He wanted, and, and when Blair, when Tabash comes in, he takes over his body, and he walks all over the place. In fact, he'll 
jump off the stage and do all kinds, but his eyes are open. He's fully interactive with you. Um, but he you definitely to, know it's a different entity. <laughs> so. It's not him. Right. And he goes into the audience and gives message for the people in the audience. Right. And uh, he's very, very good. But he stopped coming over here because he was having personal problems. Well, home, home life. Home, yeah, home, home life problems. Uh-huh. And he really missed it coming right. here. So we were able to get him this year, and he has written his first book. It's it's called Don't Change the Channel. (laughs) And he also, by popular demand, is coming back next year. (laughs) Yeah, because that's what they said. We've got to have him back. So we're going to try to have him over here more often now. Right, because his talk, it was just like it's very relevant. It's not... it's, it's, It's not... Pre-planned or like that, but it was like it's almost like a State of the Union address. That's how it felt. It was like, here's where you are now. This is what's going on. And so, um, it's like every year we would get an update on what we're doing and where we are. Mm-hmm. And Tabash is the delightful personality when he comes through. Yeah. So I think now it's his home life is probably the problem. It's not problems. It's illness the and things like that. Yeah. And so I'm thinking that's coming down to where he'll be able to come more often. And he said he'll be here next year. Okay. It's already been confirmed. <laughs> no question, it's already done. Okay, so we're going to bring him back next year. Uh-huh. And he did a lot of personal um, readings, too. Private readings, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's Blair Styra. Yeah, he was booked up before he even got here. So when you see these come out next year, when you see it, if you want to read it, book early because he books up very quickly. Yeah, I love these people. In fact, all of them, yeah. I think all of our people that were doing private sessions, they were all booked. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Even Robert Babal had a private workshop. And it it was full. Yeah. So there's a whole lot going on at the conference, but um, Blair's an old friend of ours, so we was delighted to have him back to where we could uh, see him again Mm -hmm. without having to go halfway around the world. And uh, we have husband and wife authors, Catherine Andres Andres and Patrick Andres. But and this work, this year we have Patrick's first book, and I just had him. Yeah, you had both of them on the show. With it's their book. They did that. They co-authored that book. Okay, I thought it was his. No, theirs. But um, we had them just before the conference. We had them on the show here, and the book was Naked in Public. And he was talking about dream symbolism. Right. Then he gave a workshop later on dreams. Right. And he was very well received, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. They're very knowledgeable. They they know their stuff, both of them. And I had um, uh, Catherine does, uh, she was doing some private, well, both of them together, they do this. I mean, she had private readings at her table, but then in her room, in the room, they were doing... Um, I'm not sure what you call them, but they're readings like Edgar Casey used to do, and you could get a past life or past life relationship, health, or business reading. And they, they go into the Akashic Records and they read for you. Mm-hmm. And, and I had one of those. It, it was fantastic. So there again, you know, if they come back and you, <laughs> you see them on their book or, or look them up because they, they know their stuff. They're very good. Now we said we don't publish junk. That's right. We have good authors that we publish. Okay. Uh, then we had another new author, Annie Stillwater Gray. And she kind of surprised me because I thought she was more of a quiet, reserved person, <laughs> but she was an excellent speaker. And her book is The Education of a Guardian Angel. And it's the history of her relationship with her guardian angel. He came through to her, I don't know, many years ago, and he began telling her that they were reconnected, oh, I don't know how far back it goes, down through time, when they have many, many past ones together. Of course, always playing different roles. And the book is, is in, it's in the book about that, where they have the different lives, the husband and wife, uh, mother, child, and each life was different. They were learning different things, 
until it got to the point that her guide, which she calls Darcy, got, where he didn't have to come back anymore, and he could be trained as a God's guardian angel. And he turns out to be her guardian angel. And that's why he gives her her whole history and why she he's with her. And the book is very interesting about how they get to become a guardian angel. Because I have had a lot of people tell me, too, they said, is my grandmother mm-hmm. my guardian angel? Our guide or something. Yeah. But they said they may be watching over you and checking in now and then, but it takes a long time to become a certified guardian angel. They might be an intern. <laughs> yeah. Because there's a whole lot of training they have to go through, and the book tells it all about it. All the different steps they have to go through before they are really a guardian angel. And it's interesting, they put them in situations that are very difficult. And how are you going to get the person you're watching over to change their mind because they're headed down a disastrous path? That sounds like um, <laughs> uh, Jimmy Stewart, um, the Christmas one. Oh, yeah. Oh, Art, a... Art Town? No, 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 no. Um, the no, Christmas one. One that's on every Christmas. I know what you mean. A Wonderful Life. A Wonderful Life, yeah. yeah. That's what it sounds like because that was a, a challenging situation. He had to come up with some way to get him to see what was going on. Yeah. <laughs> it was okay. Mm-hmm. It's something like mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. But it goes down through time. There, when they were watching over, would get in some pretty sticky situations, mm-hmm. and they had to find a way to help him get out. And now he's still her guide, and he's the one who uh, more or less, let's say, channeled. He put the information into her head, and she was able to type it all out. Started out being three books, huge books. And I said, no, we can't do that. So we condensed it down into one big book, The Education of a Guardian Angel. And it's very interesting. And so she she had a good reception too. Yeah. Book is an uh, education of a guardian angel. <clears throat> and we had Jack Churchward, and I'm going to ask him if he'll come on the show. You'll probably be hearing more from him in the next few weeks. He's the great grandson of James Churchward. Yeah, get it right. <laughs> yeah, I keep wanting to call them one or the other. Right, right. He is changing their names. Mm-hmm. We published his first book <clears throat> because if you, those of you out there who have been in metaphysics a long time know the name James Churchward. He's the one back in the 20s who was writing about Mu, or now we call it Lemuria, but he called it Mu, and it was the great continent that was in the Pacific that went down. And he found the information because he lived with Tibetan monks for many, many years, and they had access to hidden records. So he was able to get this information, but in the 20s, oh, they thought he was crazy, and he was really had a hard time. They gave him a lot of grief, you know, trying to say, say he was, they really, really killed him. So, his, but his work, his work, James Churchward's work is considered a pioneer, a, what's the word I want to say? pioneer. Well, his work is the first. Like groundbreaking? Groundbreaking, the first. Now it's appreciated, but back then it wasn't. <laughs> but over the years, people who are interested in Lemuria have looked up his work. Well, Jack Churchward, his great-grandson, decided to republish his great-grandfather's work. And so we published one of his a few years ago, and he was at the conference. That was was the Lifting the Veil on the Continent of Wu. Mm-hmm. And, but then now, he has access to all of these great-grandfather's work, and there's, I know he has many, many, many books. But some people have been republishing these who are not authorized to do so. They don't have permission from the estate, but they figure it's public domain, so they're putting them out there. 
But Jack found a book that had never been published that his great-grandfather wrote. And this is the one we published, and it was he was talking about at the conference. The, the Stone Tablets of Moon. And it was about the discovery of these stone tablets and this little bitty statue of all these figurines. They found all of this, and they were studied by the scientists. This, these were back in the 30s, somewhere in their 20s and 30s, and they could not have been, been, they found them in Mexico. They could not have come from there. And, um, that as they investigated them, they found out there was a hidden city underneath Mexico City in that area. But they pinpointed where it was, and they actually dug down. But when they were doing this back in those days, it was a very dangerous place to be. There were outlaws and Indians, and they couldn't really excavate like they wanted to. But he said it was about 30 feet down. And they found layer after layer of different cities. Wow. And that's where they found all of these things. And they know they didn't get it all out. There's tons of artifacts down there. And what they did bring out, they had pictures of. And this is what is in the book, The Stone Tablets of Mu. And they were analyzed, and they don't just don't know where they came. They don't fit into any kind of history at all. So that they think this came from Mu. Yeah. Are they saying that this was part of Mu? Yeah. Okay. Because it makes sense. It would be on the edge. Mexico, he said, all the remnants of Mu would be the Hawaiian Islands. Right. New Zealand. Yeah. And it would come up the edge, of, yeah. the edge of California and part of Mexico. So it makes sense that it would be because some of these little figures look Chinese. But they said, now, they said, what happened to all of this? Nobody knows. They, they were supposed to have been given over to a museum, but they've disappeared. Like a lot of the stuff with the Smithsonian Institute. And then they covered up the hole that they dug. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like the Smithsonian. Put a building, put a, a church on top of it. <laughs> the Smithsonian Institute has lots of things that have never been brought public that are hidden back in their archives. So these are probably hidden somewhere, but the book tells all about it. But the interesting thing was I said, well, they could go and dig it up again. If people read the book, they're going to go and and find it, because he gave the exact location of where they were digging. But the problem is now, over the years, Mexico City has grown out over that area. And he said, you wouldn't be able to go in there and dig up a parking lot. I covered it up. <laughs> or a part of a house or something on it. Right. But it's still down there. You'd have to go way down to get to it. But I've heard stories in of Mexico City where they were digging subways. And they did find some strange things. Remnants of buildings and artifacts. So there must, might be a whole city sitting underneath Mexico City. Probably. But... This is interesting. You can see these figures and symbols that they found. And it's a book that has never been published, written by James Churchward. It's called The Stone Tablets of Moo. And he's got a lot of, of books, information that he's going to be writing more about in the years to come. Like his mission now is to bring back this lost knowledge. But that's what our boss company is all about, too, Lost Nally. But we're going to have him on the show. I'm going to try to get him on the next few weeks and see what he says. He's also a researcher because he puts his own uh, take on what he finds. He does a lot of um, researching and footnotes. And Natalie Sudman... We finally got her of two years we trying to get her here after her book came out because she was nervous about it. But, oh, she had a standing ovation. People loved her talk. She was the one who had the near-death experience in Iraq. The book is called um, 
Application of impossible things. Yeah, application of impossible things. But she was riding in a truck over there with, with three other pe- a men. Mm-hmm. They were in a convoy. And there was a roadside bomb. And one of them were killed. And two of the others were injured. Right. And she really did die because her body was just really torn apart. But it's a fascinating story of how uh, she went out of her body and was working with the beings of the spirit world. The, uh, her guides and guardian angels, and also all the other beings, as they put her body back together. And it was a fascinating talk. And the book is, is really interesting, because they decided she would have just been happy to stay over there. But they decided she needed to come back. So they had to put the body back together enough that she could come back into it and live. She still has some um, problems with it, you know, with the body, because it really uh, hurt her eye. I think she said it's still blurry and right. yeah, helped her eye. And it did a lot of damage to her hand and her leg. But really, she had died. Her body was torn apart more than that. But anyway, it's a fascinating story, and she's a really wonderful person. And I was very happy they gave her a standing ovation. Oh, yeah. She got uh, an award. It's similar to um, the Purple Heart, but it's given to civilians. So her book was The Application of Impossible Things. Then another author we had was Guy Needler, and he's getting to be a, what's like almost part of our company now. He's got four books. Right. That we've published. Well, he's from England, and a lot of people probably know his books, The History of God, which was a mind blower. And then after that was Beyond the Source, books one and two, and those were mind blowers. <laughs> I kept saying, Guy, I don't know if you can do this and have your brain is going to be all scrambled by the time you get through with this. Right, because everybody needs to understand he goes through the levels. He, he goes to these to get this information, so he's going higher and higher and higher. In the history of God, he went to our God, and that was like 100 levels or something. He had to go up to get to that and go through all these things. So they're, they're like, what are you doing here? Yeah, they and, said, you're not supposed yeah. to be here. What are you here? What are you doing right. here? And then he was able to get beyond our God, and that's what that's what it says beyond the source. Because the source is our God. And get beyond there to see that there's actually 12 different sources. Yeah. And, uh, each one had different areas. Right. So then he had to go into each of their areas and try and get that information. And that took a different brain to be able to conceptualize what they were doing because it's information that doesn't exist in our world or and universe. It does not and, compute. Exactly. Because each one of these universes, so to speak, with a different God, have different rules and regulations. Right. And he explains it, but if you can wrap your mind around it, it's it's really different. I like to joke that your books are the deep end of the pool. His are the ocean. <laughs> it's <is> true. <laughs> it's really deep. But the first book he did, Beyond the Source 1, he did um, six levels. It was, and the fir- it was the first six of the 12 yeah. source entities, ours being one of them. And then the book two were the other six. So there's 12. I think they're all kind of on the same level. They're no, just different just universes. Really, I mean, right. it's really mind-bending. I think people who are uh, physicists, physicists mm-hmm. it would twist their mind around. It's, it's really open mind. <laughs> 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 so because, you know, to, to to be able to conceive that there is something beyond. I mean, so, so many people are still have trying to decide there's something beyond this planet. And now we're talking about beyond this universe versus with our source. (laughs) Yeah, and we have our God, but it's not the only God. uh, It really takes Mm -hmm. an open mind to to want to explore it. And he gives workshops. He's giving them now all over the world. 
And he had a new book. It's the fourth book. That was what he was talking on at the conference about karma. Mm -hmm. And he's just submitted a fifth book. Right. That's <laughs> that we're going to be published. Right, so he'll probably be here again next year. <laughs> yeah. That one is the origin speech. Right. So that what created all the twelve, the twelve <laughs> right. sources. Right. I wonder if there's anything beyond. Oh, that beyond probably the has to be. <laughs> probably. There's he, probably twelve origins. <laughs> well, he said there's no end anyway. Right. Right. But. All of it is things we can't comprehend. Our mind can only comprehend this world, and we can't even do that. Right. You can't imagine all the other universes and the, the rules and regulations. And I was reading it that first time. That I, <laughs> You're getting dizzy. <laughs> I know. So that will be another book we're going to be doing this right. next year of here. And so that's, and he's an engineer. I mean, he's got a job. He's, no, he's retired. Did he retire? No, he retired from that. He's in this full time. Oh, because he was an engineer and he had that job and then trying to do yeah. this mind he, bending he's, stuff. He left that about a year ago. Well, this has taken all of his time now, that, yeah, lecturing what, everywhere. Right. But that's Guy Needler, and he's in England. And his book was on avoiding karma. Mm -hmm. his book. Okay, then we had Sherry Boyle, and we talked to her, and she's been on the show twice. And we talked to her uh, before she did the UFO conference. And she also got a standing ovation. She talked about her experiences with the aliens and the UFOs since she was a child, and how she had to deal with it, being in fear, and then coming out of that. So it's we another interesting speaker. Well, that's the thing about Sherry. I mean, her story is, is so moving, but she is so authentic. That is what comes across more than anything is she's real. She is. Mm -hmm. And she was really afraid to come out and do this. Her family doesn't believe her. That's usually the way it is. You know, the ones in your own family don't believe these things you're doing. You have to do it in spite of it. You're not being accepted. Then there was this one here, Dolores Cannon. Oh, who's that? <laughs> who's that? <laughs> who is that? <laughs> okay. Because I, uh, I just had an open mic session. So a year ago, people were saying, they had so many questions after I did my talk, and they said, why don't you just do open mic to where you're just answering questions? And... Um, but once said, I wish you just had a whole day or hours that you could just answer questions. So that's what I did. I said, this is open mic, and anybody who has a question can just call in and ask. I mean, not call in, I'm sorry. The ones that would just raise your hand, and we could answer their questions. So that went really well. And they had all kinds of questions, and we took up two hours doing that. I may do that again next year because I've lectured on so many of my books and so many different things that it's kind of hard to find anything new to talk about. So just let them bring up questions that they've gotten from my books. Incidentally, I have a new book that we're going to be going to the press in the next few months. It's a new book that I finally finished. And I want people out there to understand it is not part of the convoluted universe theory. This is a separate book because I've had so much other information that uh, I want to write about. So I've just pulled all of these cases out, and they didn't fit in the convoluted universe, so I've been having several of these are going to be separate books based on a certain topic. This one is called The Search for Hidden Sacred Knowledge. And it's cases about down through time, how people had these amazing psychic abilities. They had all of this psychic knowledge, but it was taken away and it was forgotten. And, you know, in the old, way back in those days, they would burn you at the stake or they'd hang you if they thought you were working on anything like that. But it goes back to where it all came from the ETs, whenever they came here and uh, lived among the people to teach them things. 
And then before they went back, they interbred with the people to create someone to take their place. And this is where the pharaohs of Egypt came from, the ones who were teaching the people. So it's a story of the search for all of this knowledge that we have lost. And now is the time to bring it back. And that's what that's what we're doing now. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, the next thing I want to mention is uh, this. You want to talk about the cruise that's right. coming up. Yeah, we're having a, it's a Holy Land cruise and a conference at sea. So we're doing something new again. We're trying this out because we love cruises. And we've had classes on cruises. Or we had that one in Panama Canal, and then we thought, well, wouldn't it be good to have, and we've had workshops on cruises, so now we're trying to, we thought, let's just do a conference. It's like a little bit more than just workshops. It's very similar to the conference we just had. And this is the cruise of the Mediterranean, and it's going to start in Istanbul and end in Rome. Right. And we'll go all over the Mediterranean. Uh, yeah, it goes out there, but the biggest thing on the it goes through Jerusalem, it goes through Israel, goes to Malta. Those are two places that I haven't been, and I, I'm I'd yeah. like to see the you know. other places we've been to, with like Athens in Greece and the Greek islands and Naples, those areas. But this is the first time to go to Jerusalem and to Malta. But it's going to be going all over there. We're starting in Istanbul. And on the cruise, they're going to be doing talks, uh, is Robert Babal. He's going to be there. And Hakdong Adogan, which we had, I brought him, he's from Istanbul. I brought him over for the UFO conference. He's a UFO expert. He's going to be on this cruise. So the guy Needler with his wow. mind-bending information. <laughs> and also one of the speakers is going to be Maria Wheatley who is a master dowser, and her father, uh, she wrote a book about her father, how he was one of the most expert dowsers in the world, Mm -hmm. and she knows all about the sacred sites and the alignment, So she's going to be doing a talk on there, too. Right, they're doing talks and workshops. On the cruise. Right. Because we have to do that when we're at sea, because when we hit port, oh, then we have we have tours, we have excursions. Every, I mean, this is a jam-packed cruise. Because every, it's an 11-day cruise. There are three sea days, which were where we're doing the talks and the um, the workshops, and those are all included. And then on the days that we're at port, we have excursions. Every single port has an excursion. We even have one before we start, and then after we ending, we have uh, we'll be hosted at, at um, I can't remember the name of the hotel, but it's in Rome, and where Robert Baval will give another talk. So, I mean, this is a very full cruise. One interesting thing, if you've ever taken a cruise, when you hit a port and you want to take an excursion to see anything in the port, you usually have to pay extra. Right. But on this cruise, all excursions to the, uh, the site are included in the one fee that you pay to go on the cruise. Right. And, you know, cruises, there's food 24-7, <laughs> and there's all kinds of shows. There was a lot of fun. Right. So this is uh, October the 25th to November the 5th, 11 days. And it begins in Istanbul and ends in Rome. So if anybody out there is interested... You can uh, call our office. Well, or just go to the site, and you can see how to, yeah, you can call our office for more information. Our website has more information. It's all it has on the website. A, a link, doesn't it, over to that? Yeah. Because this is, it's going to be big, and you're going to have tons of fun. It's going to really be good. It's really going to be good. Okay, well, we're getting, the time is running out again, but I do want to say something that we announced at the conference. We have a new project going on. We got bored. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah, like we don't have anything else to do. We have a new project going on, and we made an announcement at the conference for the first time. We are building a university. It's going to be called Canon University of Metaphysical Metaphysical Studies. 
but it's going to be a school where we are going to teach all modalities of healing, natural healing and alternative medicine. We're going to have experts of every field in the healing modalities are going to be coming and teaching classes. And we're very excited about this. And it's here in Arkansas, and we have the land. The land just fell in our lap. It, it means it was meant to be. Right. They told us years ago we needed to have a school. Yeah, we thought, well, we do with a, we're, with a traveling school that we yeah, have here. Yeah, classes. <laughs> but they wanted us to have a brick-and-mortar school. So the land just came up, and it's beautiful, and it's right in the area where we live. And um, it's going to be big university. We're going to have a, what is it, how many a seat auditorium? 950 seat auditorium, but it'll be space enough where we can put chairs in there that increase to 1,000. And it'll be having classes, classrooms for teaching, and it's going to be two-story, and there are going to be rooms when they're teaching, they'll be able to go and practice these different things. My method of hypnosis, the QHHT, will be the cornerstone of this university. But we're going to teach everything else, too. Right, so. And then it'll also have dorms um, where people can stay, um, everything from a uh, like a hotel room, shared hotel room to a private room, to private cottages, to RV hookups, to tent sites. So any experience you want to have, it'll be there. Beautiful ground. It's on 60 acres, so there's a lot of ground where we'll have meditation areas and then yoga, the yoga out there. And it's got a creek that goes through it. And pond. So it just, it's just beautiful, and no yeah. one has ever lived on it, and I can't figure out why nobody ever built a house there. The only thing that was ever done is they had cows and cutting hay. It's been sitting there waiting for us, well, I guess, I all think. these years. <laughs> But um, it's happening sooner than we thought. The architect has now drawn up the plans and has the pictures of it. And we haven't started breaking ground yet, but that will be the next thing. And where can they see pictures of the university? Have we got them on the site yet? Not, not? yet, not yet. There's some, some where they're showing you looking at them. Um, and then I think there's some videos where we made the announcement. I think on my face, on Facebook. Facebook they put right. it on there. Right, but we don't have anything going, here it is yet. We're, that'll be coming. We'll put it on our site then. But anybody's in or has questions about that, you can call, you know, contact us here too. But it looks like that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Like, we don't have anything to do. Right, right. <laughs> Always looking for something new to do. So that's the next project we're involved with, and that's one reason I had to stay home and not do so much traveling, to focus on this new project. Right. So they knew what they were doing. Okay, we've come to the end of the hour now, and I want to thank everybody for listening tonight. Oh, oh but you didn't finish off, okay? I'm waiting for my cue. Anyway, oh, okay. have a wonderful week, everybody, as we come up on the 4th, and make it great. Okay. Well, good night, everyone. If you enjoyed the show, check out more of our other videos and be sure to subscribe and click the like button. Thank you for listening to the Metaphysical Hour with Dolores Cannon.